Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. I normally play squash in the morning so this is later on in the day so I'm getting a little bit tired and jet lagged so I'm going to have to liven you all up. I'm glad to be here and somewhat nostalgic because actually in the early 90s I worked briefly for a couple of years in the King's Fund. There are two things relevant. One of them that I was involved in a program which was using interactive video to give outcomes information to patients. And the second thing I was involved in was in programs which are about moving services from large hospitals into community settings. This is when I was transitioning from clinical practice to what I now do. And it's perhaps just worthwhile following on from our last speaker. This is all about solutions. So for me, when I was in clinical practice, one of the problems was the fact that I was a specialist surgeon and neurosurgeon. I had particular expertise where I was. I spent large amounts of my time on the telephone dealing with issues and problems from people who are at a distance. So one of the things about the healthcare system is there's a mismatch between expertise and where it needs to be. The hospital system really stemmed from the idea of sanctuary where you put people when they were severely ill. So we've got this legacy infrastructure where expertise has been concentrated. So the net result is, you may say, well, you know, it's a bit inconvenient. The net result I was seeing all the time, people for whom, if the right decision had been made, it would have made a lot of difference about their survival and their quality of survival. So if you apply that across the board, um, that's really very prevalent. And the other thing, how many of you in the room have actually looked after a relative, had a relative in hospital, a friend, family? Raise your hands if you had recently. I would bet a large number of you have actually played the part of having to coordinate that care because there are bits of the healthcare system that all in their own piece work okay but somehow or other they don't communicate and so one has to actually coordinate the care. So that was the problem that sort of spurred me to change and to move to what I do. Having been here all week, oh, sorry, all week, the last couple of days, it's been really interesting. One of the things I haven't heard so much so I thought I'd just start by saying is that Although this is all about technology, in terms of it can't happen without technology, in fact, almost all the work I do is about how you develop communities. This is about how you develop communities and you link people together. It's really all about relationships. So I think I just want to put out of the way that, you know, it isn't, it's not only is this not about the technology predominantly, it's about the problem and relationships to solve problems. So um, I, in the late 90s moved to live permanently in the USA, having initially done some programs in telehealth here in London before I moved. And I did them again to solve clinical problems that were, that were there on the ground at the time. I now work in the US Department of Veterans Affairs, which is a healthcare system in the US. It provides care to 5.6 million pa patients each year. They've been in the US Armed Forces. 26 million in all veterans exist. So it's a subset, not all of them. I worked there, um, sorry, I didn't work, but I had experience of it in, mid, in 1985 when I was doing research at UCLA. When I returned and worked, and I have worked in the VA since 1999, it was the most transformed organization I've ever been in. And it was transformed because of the use of health information systems. So health information systems, what do they do if you've got an electronic patient record? What it allows you to is actually change the location of care. And my organization, the one I work in, did an amazing job of closing hospital beds and transitioning care physically to other locations. If you don't have the patient's notes chart and the ability to make decisions, you can't move that care. So just to start off with and say, what do I do and what I'm going to talk about, I'm essentially not talking about technology. I'm talking about how you change the location of decision making in healthcare and how you use technology to do that. So I'm going to quickly take you through what we've done and why. So I was recruited in 1999 and the reason why there was an interest in developing telehealth was not because of some fascination about particular technologies being used. It was because there was then as now a major issue about access to care. The organisation I work as you can see there, it has 153 hospitals of which 150 are now actively engaged in telehealth. It has of the order of 900 community-based outpatient clinics. Now that covers the whole of the continental US, US Virgin Islands, Guam, um, and Hawaii and the islands. Now from that point, Puerto Rico. Now from that, 
despite having that number of facilities, it's still a long distance to travel. So a major issue about access to care. And telehealth was a way to actually do the things I just said, to provide access to care in ways otherwise it was difficult. So last year, and by last year, we end our financial year in October, in September, so the new one starts in October, we provided care to 380,685 patients during the year via various forms of telehealth I'll talk to you about in a moment. 100,000 of these, that care took place in rural areas and 150 medical centres and 700 community-based outpatient clinics. Just quickly to go through telehealth, um, here are some modalities that are used in the organisation I work in. I predominantly involved in implementing what I'll describe in a moment as clinical video telehealth, store and forward telehealth and home telehealth. I'd just like to say in passing, because one of the things which has been commented on is the whole thing about definitions. Now, the whole thing is fraught with difficult definitions. I'm not going to attempt to go there. I think being a simple-minded soul, when this works, as inevitably it will, it is just going to be called how you deliver healthcare. Nobody's going to give it a name at all, any more than we do about banking. The other thing I'd just like to say is when it works, this is going to happen, I believe. The only issue is how it's going to happen. If you think of a technology we all use, which is the telephone, when that was introduced into healthcare, exactly the same kind of issues arose. However, even to this day, nobody is very clear how the telephone is used, what it does, what its benefit is, and how it's used most efficiently. So there's an example of a technology which has just immersed itself in care, and nobody really has a clue how it's used. We know we can't do without it. So this is going to happen to all these technologies which are used for telehealth. The only question is, are we going to do this in a rational way that will help transform healthcare and actually make it more efficient? So we're talking about a revolution that this is going to be part of. So I won't dwell on the definitions. Um, a future vision of it in the organisation I work for is very much being focused on the veteran. It's looking towards the future and based on results. So first programme I'm going to talk about is home telehealth. So if I ask in the audience... Who in the audience now is looking forward that as you get older to actually going into long-term nursing home care? Who's got that as an aspiration? So this is personal for all of us in terms of these kind of technologies because otherwise that's what may happen. Well, veterans like anybody else equally well, despite what was thought about 30 years ago when people felt our expectations were nursing homes, people are living longer, staying healthier, and they want to stay in their own homes. So the derivation of this program was all about that. So the population that um, it was focused on was the ageing population, particularly the aged uh, over 85s. The organisation has cohorts of patients that relate to wars in the past, and it me means particularly the aged over 85s, large numbers. So um, the program piloted in between 2000 and 2003, and we showed results that really warranted taking it nationwide. So I was responsible for, from 2003, finalising the model, what it looked like, and taking it nationwide. We currently, as you're sitting there and I'm standing here, have 72,000 patients who are being monitored. So by monitored, pulse weight, temperature, blood pressure, disease management protocols to be able to analyse disease-specific issues. We have a dedicated national training centre, train several thousand staff each year, and it takes three weeks to train a staff member, and 96% of that training is done virtually. So if I take us through, just quickly, here shows the growth of the programme. Stemming back to 2003, there were 800 patients. And you can see the growth trajectory. Last year, 66,000. We're now at 72 and planned by October to be at 92,000. So um, one of the things, um, from my point of view, um, I approach things in a sort of my own logic. My own logic goes as follows. If you're going to develop a large program and roll something out, firstly, it makes sense to stand on the shoulders of anybody you can who's gone before, rather than trying to do it anew. And the other thing is to get a group of people together to really analyse what you need to do. It costs fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000. Taking a pilot is $100,000, $140,000. Taking something into production might be four to $7 million. 
So where would you invest all your effort? You'd invest it and make your mistakes when it cost you 14,000. So one of the things as I look around and people talk about this, A, lots of people don't sort of learn from what's gone before. They think this is all new, we can reinvent. And the second thing is there's this frenzy and the mistakes are made when it's in pilot and production. I often get people who come to me and they say, look, we've done this great pilot, we've got these great results. And when you look at what you've got, they basically haven't answered the fundamental questions of how this would ever be implemented. And it's basically, you know, it's like a check that's going to bounce. You, all you can do is say, look, you've done a great job, but you can't take it anywhere. So if you're thinking about taking something and you're actually thinking about seriously this being something that's going to go and be used, you have to pay attention to it. So one of my favorite expressions is, the devil is in the detail. So the vision of this, the vision of saying we'll care for people in their own homes, we'll use technology, quite honestly, you, know, you don't have to be that bright to stand up and give the vision. However, what we're going to do tomorrow and the next day, and then how we're going to change course because something we didn't expect happened, that's where the devil is in the detail. So I'll talk a little bit about the devil of some of those details, um, because there are clinical issues, legal issues, business issues, funding issues. The organization I work in is no different from any other. This has not been mandated. It has been necessary to painstakingly work through every one of those issues when I say the devil is in the detail. So there was a program based on caring for people with chronic conditions, and that was what um, we did for that. Second area, when I talk about identifying something which is a problem for the organization needing a solution, is it turns out that 20% of the patients that the organization I work in cares for have diabetes. Now, one of the side effects of diabetes is you can get sudden, unrecognized blindness from complications of diabetic eye disease. So, screening diabetic eye disease is a potential population of um, a million patients who need to be screened. Some of that needs to be done face to face. Some of it in rural areas can be done remotely using digital cameras, um, what's called teleretal imaging. So similar kind of thing. This just shows you that the, um, the image is taken digitally, it's stored, it's sent elsewhere to be read. And so basically your scarce resources, your ophthalmologists and your optometrists can read and they don't have to see these necessary so many patients face to face. There were clinical concerns because this is part of the bread and butter of eye care. Um, and so there were concerns before we did this. But as it turned out, the program has freed up space in eye clinics such that people are seeing and it's reducing waiting times. Now, this program started around about 2000 again. I got the program in 2004. It took about two and a half years, two years, to take that program. Well, sorry, I got in 2003 and it took till 2005 to work the model out for this. When the model was worked out in 2005, we went from again about 1,000, 1,200 patients to where we are now. So last year we screened 171,000 and by the end of next year, this year, sorry, by October, it should be 256,000 patients each year. This is not cumulative. This is a yearly number that we're actually screening. The last area of telehealth I'm just going to talk about is what we call clinical video telehealth. That's essentially replicating what would be a face-to-face -face encounter between a patient and a <coughs> physician or other um, healthcare professional, psychologist, nurse, etc. That does what I mentioned back at the beginning, when I said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to intervene at the patient and help with decisions? I don't know of any healthcare system that actually values the cost of a healthcare decision. So it is assumed that if you see a cardiologist or a general practitioner or you see a vascular surgeon, essentially they are all much the same. The, though the costs may vary because of salaries and the costs may vary something because of local conditions, nobody actually values whether you had the appropriate decision made versus the inappropriate one. So let me give you a quick example. You could end up, or I could end up, I hope it's not me anyway, I hope it's not you either, but one could end up um, falling and fracturing your forearm. Now, one of the complications of fracturing a forearm is you can get something called a compartment syndrome, which is where there's swelling, and the swelling is then contained within um, what's called the fascia, some connective tissue. 
if it swells and it's contained within that, you can end up having an ischemic arm where you basically can't use your hand because the muscles are um, ischemic. Now, if that happens, the cost of that is going to be very large in terms of rehabilitation of that person afterwards, and they may not get back to work. So an appropriate decision made in a peripheral accident department by virtue of somebody who recognises that, the consequences of that may be infinitely more than the cost of the $70 or whatever it might be to actually take that about. So I say that because the, this is really about decision making and it's about a knowledge base and knowledge systems to do it and we haven't anywhere in place got any kind of system to be able to value that. So the reason predominantly why the organisation I'm in has got involved in doing this kind of telehealth is because we end up having large numbers of people with mental health issues. People when they've got mental health issues in the organisation I work in often go, uh, who are served by the organisation, often go to very remote places. So there's the travel difficulty with getting there, they may also have problems financially with driving, so if you can intervene early before they decompensate you can end up making a big difference, increasing access, making things more effective. So we started in 2002 with this, and we started off with about um, 1,200 consultations each year taking place. We formalised the process in the same way I talked about it. So when I say formalise, it's actually saying let's have standardised clinical technology and business processes to support this. And then when it's done that, and one's quite clear this can be systematically done, you can then distribute it disseminate it and you can train staff because you have a way in which it needs to be done. So we went from that number to 200,000 last year, we'll end up somewhere in the region of 308,000 by the end of this year. We have a large national network in the US which is IP video based. You can direct dial from one site to another site and have developed a capacity which probably means we can, with this capacity, go to something like 1.3 million consultations per year taking place under this kind of arrangement. So the plan is to move towards that over the next few years. In terms of just some of the outcomes to be able to, to give you, um, the Home Telehealth Programme reduces, these are just current data because this is um, the outcomes data that we just use for routine management that we pulled. So we get a 53% reduction in bed days of care. That's with the home telehealth. We get clinical video telehealth. That reduces bed days of care by 28% for the mental health patients served. The mean score for satisfaction for home telehealth is 86%. For the store and forwards is 92% and results are pending for the other area. The reductions in travel, which the VA picks up um, for some patients is $34.00. 45 cents per consultation and for the store and forwards $38.81. Looking at the costs across the board for the home telehealth patients and then looking at the, um, the cost savings associated with implementing this technology, we're seeing between $1,238 and $1,999 saving per patient who's managed by the program and we currently have 72000 who are being managed. The costs, so it costs us the order of $1,885 per annum per patient. Now this is a group of patients, so we started to use the kind of vernacular of an installed base with a population of patients who are at risk of going into long-term nursing home care. They cost more than $27,000 in all to be able to manage and these were people who are likely to end up in nursing home care beds. So supporting them living in their own homes costs that much per year. When I did this, the analysis associated with this originally, the cost of providing in-home care to support them was around $14,000 per year, and the market cost of a nursing home bed was $70,000 a year. So that creates the installed base. And so from that installed base, we're gradually expanding and moving to use less, um, to, to, uh, less complex patients. So beginning to look at bigger panel sizes and the rest. I haven't got the time to go through all the details of how it's structured, the clinical, technical and um, business processes. The store and so the cost of the video telehealth is $114 per consultation and the store and forwards $59 per consultation. Questions at the end, well I'll just, since I've got a few more moments, about two minutes, 
just say, so from my point of view, I believe that this is about developing very large networks. I think that this is not going to be about um, how you end up having lots of small bespoke programs. And again, being a simple-minded soul, there are certain things, from my point of view, that make great sense. So the kind of networks we're talking about, I believe, grow from high-volume, low-cost applications. When I first started doing this back in 1999 and trying to really grow these programs, at that time, people were getting very much involved in telehealth with doing high-end programs, doing things like specialty consultations for transplantation. Doing, so I liken it. If you try and build a network where you take something which is very high cost and very low volume and you try and grow it, it's almost exactly like trying to build a pyramid where you try and put the stone at the top up there and then you try and build it down. If what you do is you end up having the base you build, then what you can do is you can amortize your costs and you can end up gradually moving upstream to be able to do it. So from my point of view, this is not that complicated. It is just there are a lot of moving parts and it's about paying critical attention to the detail. So. I said this is about relationships. Often when you start a pilot off or you start something off, the way it works is because you need a relationship, because there isn't a process in place. Now, also, the people who often start doing pilots are pretty much zealots who like to do their own thing. So great to get something off the ground, but then you reach a stage where if it's going to grow, you've got to convert relationships into processes. Because where businesses fail and where enterprises fail, the kind of things I do fail, is not when you've got your pilot done and it's steady state. It's when you want to ramp it up. And that's when everything that was based on processes begins to... So, a quick example. The program that had piloted the home telehealth program before I took it nationally, the way of distributing equipment was there was a nurse who had a cupboard and one access database regionally. So to end up taking something from three hospitals to 150 and ending up having something that you had to distribute equipment, those are the kind of issues. So the devil being in the detail, and one of the things about academic studies, which are tremendously important, I'm not in any way, they really help understand, define the issues, but they often are based on relationships, they're special circumstances. So. If you say things like this sometimes to somebody who's done academic study, they'll say, oh, that's just a minor detail. This stands and falls on all those minor details. Once you've got the relationships in place, so there's quite a high cost to get the overhead to be able to systematize this. Once you've got the overhead in place and you've got that in place, the marginal cost of growing it becomes less and less and less. So I think on that note, I'll just finish to be able to say, um, this, I believe, is developing large networks. I think it has to be done with a discipline. You have to do it because you are committed to what it's going to end up and be accountable. So I've been accountable in terms of doing this. I'm grateful to the organization I work in, in terms of the foresight it's got, the leadership in terms of investing in this area. And lastly, I'd like to say, in the, um, the vein of standing on people's shoulders, is that this is based, really, you have to have a computerized patient record underlying this. Because if you're going to make a decision, you have to have the data for the decision. So I'm standing on the shoulders of others gone before, so let me, in passing, in finishing, just pay tri tribute to the many colleagues I've worked with who I won't list a name here, but it's their efforts and enthusiasm that's brought this to be. Thank you all.